Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Guitar Craft and Other Stuff podcast. Today we have a guest, Matthew Dale, and I'm sure he's going to tell you a little bit about his music journey, what he does professionally, but I want to start by telling you something very strange and how I ran into Matthew on YouTube. So as some of you may know, I'm doing something right now called the Strandberg Experiment. And before doing that, I spent six, seven months watching Strandberg videos and trying to find people who were interested in Strandbergs. Matthew Dale, as you can see, is holding a Strandberg. So I'm like, all right, I, that's the first video I saw of his. Some of you don't know this yet, but the next experiment is going to be the analog experiment because I've been a digital guy my entire life and I'm going to analog. And so over the last two months, I've been researching that and Matthew popped up again because he did the complete opposite. I think he went from analog to digital. So that video was so educational for me as well. Mm -hmm. Then I saw last month, PRS announced that they're doing a SE model of the DG, DGT guitar, DBT, what, three letters. DGT, yeah. DGT. And I'm like, oh, I always wanted to try one of those. I'm probably going to buy the SE version to review. So I look for a good review of a DGT. Here he is again. I've been experimenting lately with thumb picks. And I noticed that he also uses thumb picks, but he uses the type that is a pick, <laughs> like a real pick that's clamped into place. And so I bought some of those. I was experimenting that I noticed he had those two. I'm like, this guy is always on the same wavelength as me. I need to reach out to him and hear more about him. And if you go to his channel under his name, Matthew Deal, you'll see, of course, he's an amazing player and very articulate, very clean setup. And uh, he gets much nicer tones than I can on YouTube. So uh, welcome, Matthew Deal. And I'm um, glad to have you here today. Hey, thank you so much for having me. That was... Um probably the perfect uh intro that was great um you're like my perfect uh youtube audience because <laughs> you hit most of you know all of my big videos that have kind of blown up and let's see um oh um i, I was gonna say that i think the dgt video i haven't really been on youtube that long i've only been doing this for about um a year um, my first lesson video was September of 2021. Um, and since then, let's see, I've got about 2,000 subscribers. And um, the biggest videos that kind of popped up on my channel would be, I did an FRFR video, how to get good FRFR tones, uh, my DGT review, my Strandberg review, and my my uh, journey from analog to digital. So those were like all of my big ones, and you kind of hit um, hit all my big ones there. So uh, once again, thank you for having me on, and uh, thank you for watching my videos. Yeah, of course. You know, it's funny that you mentioned the FRFR video, because right before we started, I was like, let me go back and look at Matthew's channel. And I was scrolling through, and I'm like, oh my God, this is a video that I need to watch, because... When I first bought my Axe FX, I bought an FRFR speaker with it. I plugged it in one time and I was like, this sounds horrible. And I immediately returned it. And I yeah. was like, you know what? I'm just going to run it through regular studio monitors because if I'm going to spend this much money for something that sounds like garbage, I might as well just use my studio monitors. And now I'm learning that it might have sounded like garbage because I didn't watch your video first before returning it. So... <laughs> Sorry, we might have a little bit of a delay. Um, I think one of the best lessons that I got in college was um, all speakers suck. It's just to what degree. <laughs> and, you know, especially from like a recording standpoint, um, we love our nice microphones, micro microphones, large diaphragm condensers. Microphones are kind of like the audio engineers. Um, holy grail. They love their microphones. But when it comes to speakers, even in the spectrum of really nice speakers, really nice studio monitors, um, really nice PA speakers, really nice guitar cabinets, they all have their own idiosyncrasies. So my, my go-to, my suggestion for anyone that is trying to dial in tones, try to recreate what you're doing live most of the time. So I have my studio monitors um, that are Personas Aris E5s. They're okay studio monitors. And then I have um, my QSE uh, K10s on the floor, and I bounce back and forth between 
when I'm getting live tones set up. And I also dial in, I try to dial in all my live tones loud um, because Fletcher months in effect, you're going to, you're going to exacerbate certain frequencies when you're playing at loud gig volumes versus when you're playing quieter in your studio. And I also have the exact same speakers as you, except I have the 3.5, so they're slightly smaller, but the pre ones, this mm. is, this, so once again, <laughs> always on the same page. Yeah. How about that? When I first sent you an email, we had to wait a little bit of time because I think you were maybe gigging or on tour. You want to talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that? What were you doing? Yeah. So uh, one of the projects that I'm involved in is called The Prophecy Show. It is a tribute to Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Uh, and my joke is always that uh, we're a tribute band of a tribute band. But it is uh, it's such a fun time. It's a great holiday show we have amazing vocalists um i'm the lead guitar player i'm the music director um uh, i have some tour management duties that i do on the road i was also the van driver <laughs> this year as well so i wore a lot of different hats um but it's such a fun thing i've been involved with it for about five years this is my fifth touring season with the band um we had 16 amazing shows on the road uh we do a lot of stuff in the midwest i'm based out of st louis um, we did a lot of shows in Illinois. We do a big run of shows in uh, Florida and Alabama and some of the uh, other southern states. And I think next year we're going to make our way up to Wisconsin and a couple of other northern states. We'll kind of get around a little bit, but um, it's all TSO music. And it's kind of funny for me because I never really came from a hard rock uh, technical background. Um, mostly growing up, I was always kind of like a blues and a blues rock player. Um, that was my guitar and my musician identity for a long time. Um, and then I got the call for this audition through a mutual friend and I'm like, wow, now I've got to like build up three note per string scale chops and some of the other stuff that I need to do. So luckily I passed my audition and then since then I've been sort of adopting a little bit more of a hard rock and a little bit more alternate picking type of, uh, playing in my, uh, in my, you know, technical chops in my repertoire. Um, and that's not something that I've always been super comfortable with. So especially being a thumb pick player, the thumb picks that I use are Fred Kelly bumblebees. And I found that the, uh, jazz picks, the jazz style picks are as as good as I can find for something that works with my style, which is mostly finger style, um, and then adding in the alternate picking sort of stuff. This is about as good as it gets for me. I used to take the uh, Dunlop thumb picks, which are horribly long, um, way too long for most alternate picking, and I used to like file them down and shave them down to a pick shape. Um, and these I don't have to. It's great. I don't need to spend a half hour. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Um I don't need to spend the time. I can just pull these out and then use them um, as as I will. So I was so excited when I found these. I don't remember how I found these, if I was just scouring the internet uh, or whatever, but it's like this is like my ideal, my perfect my perfect pick. So um, being involved with the Prophecy has been both um, musically rewarding. It's been personally rewarding. Um, it's been career rewarding because I'm touring and I'm, you know, doing the doing the musician thing, doing the guitar player thing. Um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about it. So when you were on this prior tour, did you use your Strandberg Axe FX rig? Uh, I use my Axe effects, Yes. Um, that's my main, uh, my main touring setup, but I did not use, uh, my Strandberg. Uh, <laughs> uh, mostly I'm a PRS player. So I have my DGT, like the review that you saw, and then I have a 594, and those are the ones that I typically alternate on the road. Um, I thought about breaking this out um, and using this on tour because it would it would work perfect for the tones that I'm getting. However, there's a couple of um, issues that I would have with the Strandberg on the road, um, in particular, and they're kind of they're really super small. But at the end of the night, we need to put our guitars down and, and line up for a bow, and it needs to be really quick. Well. The guitar stand that I'm bringing <laughs> is a headstock rest. So without the headstock, I can't really find a way to quickly do that. So I could have gotten a new stand and I could have used the Strandberg there, but I've already been using my PRSs for five years, so I'm comfortable with it. 
The other thing, which I think is even more hilarious, is I was talking to my wife, and, and I'm like, you know, I think I want to break out the Strandberg, and I think I want to play the Strandberg for uh, Prophecy, and I think her exact words were, no, please no, it looks too weird, you need to be, you know, more straight ahead, you need to be, you know, it's classic rock stuff, you know, rock stuff. Don't go, uh, don't go with a Strandberg. I'm like, there's plenty of modern rock players that are playing Strandbergs now. I think it's, I think I'd be safe, but. It's funny because that, that's part of the show, right? If you're on stage in a certain context, could you play, could you take a Strandberg and go play a straight ahead jazz gig? Would it sound fine? It definitely would, but people will be looking at you very strangely, you know? And, uh, you know, live show is a performance i mean could you imagine if we saw joe bonamassa on stage with a stramberg people would be so upset like where is his vintage he would look so weird yeah exactly that's funny Mm -hmm. so i i noticed that you have a pretty extensive studio setup is this how you is this what your main career is do you do a lot of studio work no, the the whole studio setup that I have um, kind of behind me, really most of my stuff is on this side, but it's for production-wise, it's easier to face my computer and everything. Uh, really, it's been mostly just born out of passion. What I, what I do professionally most of the time is um, I'm a teacher, so I like having this studio space as a teacher. I like having access to recording stuff and interfaces and mixers to mix in different things. Um, and then I'm also a player, obviously. Um, but a lot of what I've been doing in the last couple of years, aside from the Prophecy Show and this new production that I'm working on, um, and I can talk a little bit more about that later um, if you're interested. But um, most of the time what I'm doing throughout the year is I'm playing like solo acoustic or solo electric like jazz gigs or wedding gigs or private parties and that sort of thing, uh, corporate type of events, some of the more boring stuff <laughs> that um, uh, that I do throughout the year. But uh, it's fun. It's rewarding for me because it's it's definitely a different style of playing. Um, but the the studio aspect has just always been something I've been interested in. I've always been interested in recording, and I like having the tech that's available to me to. You know, um, for example, if if someone has a song request for um, a wedding and they're like, I, you know, I need an arrangement. I want this. I want to hear your take on it. Then I can work up an arrangement and then just quickly hit record and then send them a demo, that sort of thing. Um, I like being able to do that really quick at um, at any given moment. And then for lessons, I like to touch a little bit on what I would cons- what I would consider um, any of my students that are really interested in this, the days of you just being a guitar player are kind of in the past. A, a modern musician, someone that wants to do this for a living, you're going to need uh, these other skills to supplement your main thing. That could be recording. That could be teaching. Um, that could be songwriting. That could be a lot of these other different 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 things. Excuse me. Um, so I like to kind of touch upon like, you know, let's go through a song and let's record a song. Let's write a song. Let's talk about how to get a decent mix. If you are recording your band, um, I try to give very modern, uh, musician lessons and having my studio space sort of built out to supplement that, uh, has been huge. Um, back when I, I first started teaching in, um, you know, like back room of the music store type stuff. Um, you just don't have access to all of that stuff. And it's, it's really tough to teach those lessons. It's really tough to teach like, man, this sound that he's getting on this, uh, record is like a, a driven maxed out plexi. And if you don't really have that sound, you don't really have that sound coming out of, you know, a little practice amp. It's really hard to convey what that is without, you know, plugging in like my Axe FX or my FM3 or something and actually really showing what that sound is. Um, so this has been, you know, several years in the making of what I want to do in a lesson with my students and have all of the tools available that they can really experience firsthand. Did you learn your studio craft, so to speak, in school or was this mostly your own trial and error? A little bit of both, actually. So um, when I've always been like musically minded. I've been playing guitar since I've been about six or seven years old, um, taking lessons, you know, for the most part. Um, 
and then wanted to, after I graduated high school, I wanted to go into music in some capacity. And I first started my career, my college career, at Webster University in St. Louis uh, for audio production. So I did the first year of just audio production. And they touch a lot on the basics, you know, how microphones work, um, how to get a basic recording chain going, a little bit of basic MIDI and that sort of thing. Um, And then I really wanted to get into studying more about, you know, this crazy six string thing. Um, And Webster for me is a great music school. They have a great conservatory. They have a very well-known jazz program. At the time, I was not interested in, in jazz, uh, jazz guitar. And I took lessons, um, from a a great, a great St. Louis player, a great well-known teacher in the area. They were jazz lessons. I took them, you know, as an extracurricular in college. But the, the notion was, you know, I was at, at the time, like I said, I was always like a blues and a blues rock player, but I am interested in learning. So I, I don't mind learning what is going on within the world of jazz, but I don't really, think of myself as just switching identities to now, you know, I've seen the light and now I'm going to be a jazz player. Um, But the lessons were always sort of curtailed to, okay, well, now you want to be a jazz player. No, you're not quite listening to what I'm saying. I want to learn about what jazz is, what the makeup of jazz is, but I want to try to superimpose it into my own style. So I didn't really resonate with that style. And then if I did go into the school, it would have been more heavy jazz, classical, um, and do the school type of thing. So I actually transferred to a college called McNally Smith College uh, of Music in um, St. Paul, Minnesota. And they kind of taught more of the Berkeley uh, method. They were right smack dab in the middle between Berkeley on the East Coast and then MI on the West Coast. So their whole idea was um, a contemporary music school. It was still pretty heavy in jazz and classical. I took, I think, two years of classical, um, and I did a lot of classical in some of my private lessons, um, as well as jazz. But then there was also this air about, you're going to be doing, you know, funk ensembles, blues ensembles, pop ensembles. Um, We're going to be studying, you know, all of 20th century music, not just working up to the 1950s and stopping. Um, We're going to be doing a lot of other styles of music that you would be doing. And then they had a really great recording program. Um, They had a really great songwriting program. Um, And it was a smaller school. There were only about 200 people or so in my my class, in the class that I, I joined. So... Um, you got to collaborate with a lot of different people a lot as well. And some some people, some of the people that I graduated with are still working in bands together. Um, actually, funny story. So I went to the same school that Corey Wong went to. I'm sure you've heard of Corey Wong. He's been blowing up. Uh, Corey Wong is a Minnesota guy. He went to McNally Smith, and his drummer, uh, Pitar Janich, is... Um, was in my class up there as well. Great drummer, um, great guy. So there were a lot of, like, small... Um, uh, niche connections that people made while they were up there as well. So I studied a little bit more of recording up there along with my main focus was guitar performance. Um, I I was watching uh, one of your other uh, podcast episodes and you mentioned that, yeah, we had to do uh, four semesters of keyboard. I remember doing the four semesters of keyboard um, begrudgingly. Um, But uh, I loved, I loved going to music school. Um, I knew that I always wanted to be a player, but I also knew that I wanted to supplement my music career, my playing career with these other avenues of mostly for me teaching and recording. Yeah, I think it's really cool that even when you were, you know, late teens, early 20s in music school, you had the foresight to realize that you wanted to learn jazz from a theoretical perspective, perhaps take a few things you can use in your own music, but you didn't want to go down the path of now I'm going to buy an arch top and a whatever solid state amp, and now I'm going to be a you know a jazz guitarist exclusively, and mm. I think that's so. It, but it was tempting. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when I was in college, I actually got an ES one seventy five, and you know played 
um, put 12 flat wounds on it, and I did sort of that thing for a while. And then after I got out of school and I was enjoying my solid body guitars, and I think mostly I resonate with solid bodies um, anyway, then I, you know, my 175 became a wall hanger, and I'm like, man, I just need to reallocate the funds that I put into that guitar and then put it into something that I would be playing a lot more of. Yeah, you know, I, I come in contact with a lot of students, and this I felt like this is especially true for adult learners. Teenagers, kids, they don't really care as much in my experience, but when it comes to adult learners, the second you start to teach them just a little bit of jazz theory, they immediately panic, mm. you know, because they think, oh, I'm not a jazz player, that's not my thing. It's like, hold on, just take a breath. I'm showing you one interval. It's going to be okay. You can add the steer pentatonic scales. Yeah. It'll make it more interesting. It won't sound jazzy yet. Like I think sometimes guitarists are afraid that they're going to wake up one day and be a jazz guitarist. Like, unfortunately, it's not that easy, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. That And that's a really good point. Um, I find that I'm, I'm such a nuts and bolts music nerd. Um, and... Something that I often say, you know, both to myself and to my students, I'm really not interested in being a guitar teacher. I'm really interested in being a musician teacher, a music teacher. Um, however, you know, you're going to become, you're going to come to me because you want to learn how to express yourself musically through this instrument. Um, the the best goal through lessons is really to get the guitar out of the way of the music that's happening in our brains. Um, and with that, I take part I take songs apart in my lessons with my students right so it's not just you know how do we play you know the riff to crazy train but where does that riff come from um you know we have the minor the f sharp minor scale that's going on then we have this triad run that's an a major triad an e major triad or e major triad d major triad and then back to an a major triad breaking things down that way um some students can really resonate with that and do um and, and do great things with that. However, I feel like much like what you're saying is I have to do a lot of legwork to convince them that they should focus on those things. Um, you don't need it to play the riff. You can physically work up the, the chops and the technique and you can just put your fingers on the fretboard where it goes. But if you really want to become a musician and you really want to learn music as a language then you should really pay more attention to these lessons on how to really think of music um, holistically. And you're not just learning one song, now you're learning several concepts that can be applied to an infinitely number, an inf infinite number of songs. Yeah, I find I'm pretty much exactly the same way. And the courses that I have, and we'll talk about your courses as well in a second, but the courses that I have, um, people send me emails asking, you know, what they can learn from it. And I find it kind of difficult to explain because I'm not teaching you licks. I'm not even teaching you just a series of chords. I'm teaching you a way of looking at music that's going to allow you to do whatever you want. If you want to be a rock player and add some more fusion type ideas to your playing, my courses work. If you want to be a jazz player one day, this is a foundation right? It's, it's more about getting people to understand, like you said, the, the language of music and the language of music as it applies to the guitar. What are the quirks of the guitar? How does that relate to the language of music? And what can you take from that and incorporate into your other genres that you like to play or that you, love, that you want to study one day? And I see that you also started with a theory course as well, which I find really interesting because that's, for, for those who don't know, in terms of trying to sell music products, Frankly speaking, the worst thing you could try to sell is a guitar music theory course. It's it's you would make way more money selling <laughs> yeah. the twenty licks of BB King or the twenty licks of Joe Satriani, whatever, as opposed to a theory course. So, why don't you tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about your theory course? Yeah, so um, I would say that in a perfect world, if I was teaching a brand new guitar student, um, probably like a teenager or an adult, someone just you know very very new coming to the instrument, new to music. I would love to do nothing but spend six months or maybe even a year of just talking about music, listening to music, talking about the nuts and bolts, how it's constructed, 
That way, when we get to studying the tunes, the licks, um, the scale patterns, the shapes, the chord chord shapes, everything, you automatically have something to to relate it to up here rather than trying to to learn all of that stuff in tandem with putting it on the guitar because what's going to happen, what happens most of the time is you're going to focus on the shape more than what the shape represents. Like here is a shape of a major scale. Now you're going to be focusing on where your fingers go to execute that major scale rather than thinking, you know, root note, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and then back to the root. So my music theory course, it's called Theory Logic. And the thing that I really want to do with it is um, I call it musical critical thinking. Let's actually take a look at what's going on in music. Let's try to eliminate as much memorization as we can. And let's see if we can learn lessons that can stack on top of themselves. Something that I, I tell my students as well is we want to avoid islands of information. A major scale just isn't a major scale. And chords aren't just chords, and triads aren't just triads, and seventh chords aren't just tri uh, seventh chords, and you don't want to learn these things independent of one another because it's going to make the language of music incredibly difficult, and it's going to be confusing, and you're going to be like, well, I'm just I'm through with this whole theory thing. I'm just you know, I'm I'm just not going to get there. So in theory logic, I start from. Um, I would say that my two, my first two lessons are the most important for the course and for understanding music as a whole. Um, I start with just looking at notes and understanding where our note system comes from, which would be, um, let's take a look at an octave and let's think about that physically for a second. What is an octave physically? So A440 and A880 is a doubling of frequency, or we can half that, so, you know, uh, 220, 110, whatever. And within that octave, it's called an octave for another reason, and I kind of get to that, um, but within that thing that we perceive as the same note but a different pitch, we break it up into 12 even slices. And then through those 12 even slices, we have a pattern of those 12 that we create a major scale out of, which is not even. And I think that's the one of the most um, difficult things for people to understand if they don't look at that first. So that the major scale is a very particular pattern, whole, whole, half, whole, whole, half. Um, and I think the idea of keys, uh, I think the idea of intervals, and I think the idea of building scales outside of the major scale all gets a lot more confusing if you don't understand those two things. The, 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 our note system is broken up into 12 even spaces, and then the major scale is a certain pattern of that. And then the rest of the course is comparing all of the other concepts that I touch upon, so, you know, chords, intervals, scales, um, major scale, minor scale. I don't get too heavy into modes because in my experience, you know, if you are really, really particular in learning the major scale and the minor scale, the relative minor scale, um, modes are probably further in the back of my mind than um, I originally thought when I first started learning modes. Um, if you understand how to solo over chord changes and targeting chord tones, understanding like a modal scale becomes a little bit less important. So I don't really touch upon modes, but I compare everything back to the major scale. Um, another good lesson that I teach in the course is if we learn a major scale first and now we take a look at intervals, um, if you learn the major scale, the major scale is composed of major intervals and a perfect fourth and a perfect fifth. So you have a major second out of the major scale, a major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, and then a major sixth and a major seventh. So if you understand the pattern of how a major scale can exist on any given starting place, which would be keys, you know, A, B flat, B, C, whatever, if you understand, understand how to construct that, 
Well, now all of a sudden you know all of the major and perfect intervals. And then if you want to or if you need to conceptualize what a minor interval would be, well, you just move it down a half step. Or, you know, an augmented fourth, you just move it up a half step or diminish fifth, you know, conversely. So everything is comparative to the major scale in this course. Um, and I think it, it, it really makes music make sense. That's kind of the tagline that I use um, on, my, on my website, make theory make sense. Um, and then later on in the course, I get into breaking down some, some tunes, focusing on the number system, analyzing tunes, what's going on. Um, a little bit, uh, mostly chord wise, cause I think chords, um, would be how most people would be getting into it from a beginner level, um, understanding chord progressions, then taking a look at some melodies and how melodies are existing around those chords as well. Well, that's how people should look at it. They should start from chords, but no one wants to start from chords, especially yeah. guitar players. Like, again, I'm, I have my own courses, whatever I started with an entire series on chordal playing and chordal harmony, mm -hmm. specifically because of what you just said. If you can understand the chords, if you can understand how they fit into a simple, simple major minor scale, everything else is going to, if you want to learn the mode after that, it takes, I can teach you every mode in the major scale in literally one minute. If you understand a major scale and mm -hmm. chords already, it takes no effort and no time whatsoever. And um, I really feel that that is such an important and crucial, crucial, crucial foundation, especially for soloing over chord changes. And again, soloing over chord changes doesn't mean jazz. You should solo over chord changes in the blues as well. Right. It makes it sound more sophisticated. But students have a tendency to feel like that they need to learn all of the modes, which, which you should learn eventually. It's good to know. Sometimes people feel that mm -hmm. that's going to be the thing that sets their soloing to the next level, but it's not. In fact, if you just focus on the modes and you don't focus on the chords, you're going to set your playing back many, many years. You'll be able to shred. Right. You'll be able to shred up and up, up and down, but it's not going to sound musical, you know? Yeah, and um, I think anyone that thinks that soloing over chord changes is a jazz thing... Um, one one of the players that I that I will often um, cite would be uh, um, um, Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits. Uh, I I broke down some of his licks that he plays in um, Sultans of Swing um, pre solo. I might have talked a little bit about the solo in that video. I don't remember, but um, Mark Knopfler is such a chordal player, um, and he plays licks that you wouldn't you wouldn't hear it and think like oh he's playing like a jazz lick or something um it sounds like he's playing blues and rock licks but they're so intimately connected with um the chord changes another another good example again this is from my channel would be um neil Schoen, journey the solo for lights is surprisingly even though it's mostly pentatonic uh as far as the the overall construction of his phrases He's very careful on selecting um, end points and landing points around the around the chord tones. And for the most part of it, when he's soloing over it, he's actually targeting the fifth of every single chord for a lot of his phrases. And I didn't really pick that up until I, you know, kind of broke it down and started studying it. Um, but I don't think it's something that he's necessarily trying to do. I don't think he's he's going into that solo thinking like. Oh, you know, I'm going to hit the fifth on every single end phrase of this stuff. But I think, you know, as you grow as a musician and you can start to hear those good landing places, then he's, you know, he's instinctively going to a chord tone. And that chord tone happens to be the fifth across like four measures. It's, it's insane that like four consecutive chords, he's targeting the fifth um, on that chord or something like that. It's, it's, it's crazy. So, yeah, it's not just a jazz thing. Um, of course, in jazz um, soloing, we focus on the chords a lot um, rather than modes. You can get into modes like if you're studying stuff like Miles Davis, um, so what? That's definitely a place where I would be thinking modally because it's just, you know, it's eight measures, 16 measures of D minor before it goes to E flat minor and then back to D minor, right? So 
modes all day on on that sort of thing. But a, but if you're getting into like standards, uh, Great American Songbook type thing, then yeah, all of those songs weave in and out of different tonalities. And unless you want to sit there and think about every single key that you're going to be in for one or two measures, it's much better to just focus on what the chords are telling you rather than what the key that you're in. Um, in rock and blues, we're much more heavily focused on, okay, what key am I in and how can I find my licks around that? Um, but especially if you want to get into the finer details of of blues, and Josh Smith is amazing at this. Um, he's very chord heavy. Robin Ford is very chord heavy. A lot of the Robin Ford licks are are built around um, chords and moving from chord to chord. The way that he uses um, symmetric diminished scales to to build tension to go from a one chord to a four chord, you know, it sounds heady, and and I guess in in a sense it can be, um, but you can adopt these these lessons. Um, into your playing to really enrich your own playing and ultimately make yourself a more expressive soloist um, and uh, and really, you know, just grow. You know, we so often guitar players get stuck in the, well, now I'm playing my same old scales, um, pentatonic blues scale, three note per string, whatever it is. Um, the place that I point them to is, okay, let's put the scales aside. Let's focus more on chords. And kind of to get back to your point that you mentioned about starting guitar players um, on chords. When you think about really what we're doing, if we're going to be, you know, working musicians, what we're doing most of the time, ninety percent of what we're doing is chords, right? We're rhythm rhythm players, probably first and foremost, backing up a sol- a, a soloist, a singer, or something. And and I feel like, like you said, chords are something that is not often explored, especially with like you know, call it backing track culture. I love backing tracks. I love, you know, putting on a backing track and warming up and doing all this stuff. But it's definitely heavily tilted towards um, solo over this backing track, something that I like to do myself and that I, I like to teach my students to do. Okay, can you improvise rhythm guitar over this backing track? Um, and, and can you get out of just playing, you know, your same chords? Can you actually, you know, play if it is... Um, G, D, E minor, and C. Can you play that something a little bit different that is a completely different vibe? Um, Can you play like Hendrixy stuff over it? Can you play, you know, keep the open chords. Open chords are good, but can you move things around and create an interesting rhythm part just the same as you would try to create an interesting um, improvisation or interesting solo part? Absolutely. And speaking of blues players who do this, perhaps I'm going to say the most underrated blues player who does this is B.B. King, because everyone knows B.B. King is amazing. Everyone knows he's amazing. He's not an underrated guitarist, but his ability to target chord tones at just the right time to bend into them, to bend out of them. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the thing that makes B.B. King different. And that's what makes his that that's why he can basically play. 10 maybe 20 licks over and over in every single song for decades and it always sounds good because he's always targeting the right tone at the right time and with him it's not even seventh chords or extensions it's just triads you know and just finding triads, creative yeah. ways of using triads mixed with pentatonic scales that that alone i mean it's not it's it's simple but it's really difficult to actually uh, step backward in your playing and to go back mm-hmm. to that basic thing. It, it takes a lot of practice and it's not an easy thing to do, especially if you want to shred one day, right? Because it's not as sexy right. as alternate picking and legato and all of that stuff. Yeah, and there's so much music that's accessible to you if you really know pentatonics and triads, that is is huge. Um, if you can if you can really get a good handle on triads first, and then building pentatonic notes around those triads, that's really I think the idea of the cage system, um, which is look at all of these different chord shapes as they exist. At least this is the way I teach the cage system. 
look at how all of the different chords exist up the guitar neck. And then if you know the triad, that's three notes out of the five notes that are in a pentatonic scale. So you're, you already know three-fifths of your pentatonics if you study the chords, uh, the chord shapes well. And then adding the other two notes is just right there. If you, again, you're stacking things on top of one another. You're not learning triads or chord shapes and then learning a scale shape. It should be the same. It should, you know, light up in our brains the exact same place. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's that's huge. Just like BB King, um, I've even he- heard a lot of this. Of course, Clapton's pretty heavily influenced by BB King and Freddie King. Um, certainly, Robert Johnson. Um, but there's some Clapton licks that I've learned and studied, especially if you if you listen to um, um, "While My Guitar Gently Weeps." If you really study that, he's bending a lot, especially onto the um, the dominant five chord. You know, E E major uh, in the key of E minor. He's bending up to that G sharp more than you would think. It's not just straight pentatonic or blues lick playing, he's manipulated the notes so minutely and so finely um, where, again, it's going to those chords. Anytime you have a solo that people know as, like, this signature solo to a song, say, like, Hotel California or, you know, name whatever whatever you want, if you really study it along with the chord progression that uh, the guitar player is soloing over on top of, it's going to have a very deep connection to the chords Um, and often like targeting, often targeting those triad notes, uh, thirds and fifths. And, um, and sometimes even the root, you know, even the root can be good, um, just to get into that mindset of moving your ideas from chord to chord. Oh, absolutely. I'm glad you brought up the soloing thing because, you know, as a guitarist, we all bow down to Steve Ray Vaughan. We have to, of course. Mm -hmm. But I will say, when it comes to Stevie Ray Vaughan's playing, the most memorable playing, like if I were to sing a lick from Stevie Ray Vaughan, the only one that I could really sing easily are his licks from Lenny. And of course, Lenny is a a much more chordy song than some of his other, you know, more straight blues type things. And all, and like when he has that chord emphasis in Lenny, all of a sudden, at least to me, his playing, it goes to a different level. And, you know, I'm not breaking new ground here. Everyone knows that Lenny is an amazing recording. But for someone yeah. like Steve Ray Vaughan, who, spread, who spends so much time shredding the pentatonic scale, when, at least for me, the memorable stuff for him is when I hear him do that and then lead to a chord of some sort. Anyway, I don't, I don't, I don't want to spend too much mm-hmm. time on this because... We're going to lose all the viewers because we're not talking about gear. So, you know, I, I think they got their chord, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, their, their chord education for today. So me and my bass player, just real quick, me and my bass player, Will, um, are both theory nerds. We're, we're very much in the same uh, in the same vein that, you know, you and I are talking um, right here about music and, and studying music and um, experiencing music. Uh, and he was sitting shotgun in the van we were driving from you know, one city, the next, the next venue. And everyone was groaning in the van because, oh, here they go again. They're talking about theory. And that was a perfect time for people to, you know, take, take naps in the back as we were, you know, discussing theory and guitar players and, you know, chord tone soloing and chord extensions, you know, whatever. (laughs) So let me ask you a, a fairly random question now. I know that there's always something in our guitars or our rigs or our picks or strings or whatever that's kind of scratching at us that we feel like we need to figure out a solution for some point in the new in the near future do you have one of those things right now in your rig or in your playing uh like something related to your guitar or your rig yes um Probably a few, actually, because uh, it's always something. I'm, I am, despite all the theory talk, I am quite a gearhead, and um, and I definitely get those itches of okay, well, I need this for this particular thing and that for that particular thing. Uh, a couple things that I definitely have my eye on right now, um, guitar wise, I would really like to have um, either a Strandberg with the um, with the tremolo. Uh, on it or um, another PRS. My DGT has a uh, trem on it. 
my 594 is a stop tail. But now I'm kind of kind of getting the itch for this other project that I'll be doing in the spring. Um, I'll probably need a little bit more whammy stuff, and I would like to have. Um, I can definitely get by with one guitar. I I play 11s. I don't often break strings, um, but uh, there's some sort of nagging thing in the back. Well, okay, well if you're using your DGT as your main, and you know you need, um, and it's crazy because I don't really need a tremolo. You know, there's a couple of dips and dives in the set list that I'm I'll be doing. But if I want to be accurate, then I definitely want to be accurate. But, you know, if it's not there, it's probably not the biggest thing in the world. But now I'm like, okay, well, I really want a guitar with another trim. Um, that could be like Strandberg. That could be another PRS or whatever. Um, another thing that I want mostly from like a uh, recording and a live sound um, uh, point of view would be a rack mixer. Um, I'm... On uh, in right in front of me on my desk, I have a uh, Persona Studio Live 16 uh, digital mixer, which I love. It's a great studio um, interface. It's great for live, but it's also a, a hoss. Like it's it's big. I don't like taking it out. I like leaving it in my desk and leaving my studio set up as much as, as it is. So I would like to get a uh, Studio Live 32 rack mixer. Um, that can act as a standalone mixer um, that I can just take. You know, it's like, it's two units. It's it's not a very big, it's smaller than my XFX. Um, and I can use that as a uh, live mixer or a monitor mixer. I did monitor mixing for the Prophecy Show this year with my Studio Live, which worked great. It was great to just set up all of our mixes and then just flip it on and then, you know, go. It made um, sound check so much easier this year um, than getting a new mix from a new engineer you know, night after night. Um, so I would like something that was, that would be smaller. And then, um, along with guitar gear, I'm, I'm so happy right now with the Axe FX three and the FM three. That being said, I still have the itch for the FM (laughs) nine just for something. Um, and for me, it would probably also come from like preset making. Like I would like to take my preset packs that I have available for the Axe FX and for the FM3, and then put them into the FM9 and just have a de- dedicated, exported FM9 preset pack. Um, the Axe FX3 ones probably the work, work the best for a lot of people that have picked up um, my preset packs. I haven't heard anything about you know them not syncing well, so um, I still would like an FM9 just for the all-in-one, have nine switches, go to a gig that would require me to have nine switches and go from there. But I also have an FC6. Um, that I can use in tandem with my FM3. So again, it's not like, it's not a need. It's totally a want. Um, and then I also want an FC12, the 12, <laughs> the 12, uh, big 12 switch um, unit as well. So there's always things that um, I want. And um, most of the time they're wants, they're not needs, um, but they would, you know, probably make something like 10% easier for, whatever I would be doing. Sometimes that 10% is definitely, um, worth it. Sometimes it's not. And I think that's the, I think that's the, the, the tough thing with gas, right? Gear acquisition syndrome, where is this really going to make a huge amount of difference? Is this really going to be the thing that I want? Um, and is it going to make things a lot easier or is it going to make things a little bit easier? Um, and do you really need to, I think, uh, uh, Keith, uh, I think it's Keith Williams from Five Watt World, uh, has a great perspective on this. You know, uh, using fewer guitars, get only the gear that you absolutely need. Um, that gear that you do need might be several pieces of gear, but it's just pared down to things that you need. And and that's been my experience in the last couple of years. Where when I got my FM3, when I got my Axe FX, I sold off just so much analog gear. Um, I sold two tube amplifiers. I sold a ton of pedals. I had like over 30 pedals in my collection, which is probably not the biggest collection of people out there, but it was big for me. Um, and I'm like, I don't use half these pedals anymore. Um, so I went down to, I probably only have like 10 analog pedals that are still collecting dust because I use the, the fractal stuff happily. And it's my main stuff that I've been using. I still have a 74 deluxe reverb that is definitely more of a collector's piece at this point. Um, it's nearly mint. I got a, uh, it was a fantastic find um, that came into a music store that I used to work at. My buddy, Zach, called me. He's like, you need to come in and check this out. 
Um, so it's a great amp. I don't want to turn it on a whole lot. I've only gigged with it once nervously. Um, so that'll just be a collector piece. Um, but yeah, uh, the fractal stuff for me is just, is so good and so feature rich that I don't miss anything. You know, if I can dial in my tones, like we were talking about earlier, um, the way that I want, if they're, if they're well received by sound engineers and sound techs at gigs, then that's even better. And if I can hit save on it and not have to worry about the patch cables or this knob, you know, moving here and that knob moving there or a nine volt going out or, you know, power supply going out or whatever, all of the issues that are potential with a uh, traditional analog rig, digital, I just, I've, I've gone so much into that world after resisting it for so long, I've gone so much into it and um, have gone into it happily now that, my setup is just, you know, 30 seconds. <laughs> Turn it on, plug it in, and I'm good. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk about some of that stuff going backwards. So starting with the Axe Effects, because I run an Axe Effects 3. And the funny thing for me is that when, well, I have basically one patch that I use. And I set, and it's basically just a clean tone. And then I have an expression pedal and I can bring in the dirt all the way down is my max distorted tone that I like nice. to use all the way back is my cleanest tone. And that's literally, and then I click on the delay or the reverb here and there when I need it. But you would think to yourself, well, that is, you don't need an Axe FX3 to make that happen. But the reason I bought the Axe FX3 is because, well, now I can also record that it's my recording interface. I run my speakers that mm -hmm. I listen, that I watch movies on. They they run through the Axe Effects. And if I nice. ever, if I'm ever watching that pedal show and I'm like, oh, that's a really cool idea. I never tried running a fuzz pedal into a compressor behind the amp on a leap year, whatever, right? I just go to the Axe yeah. Effects and I just wire it that way. I get my little fix of excitement and then I just go back to my regular patch. Whereas before, we've all been there. It's like, oh, I watched that pedal show, or oh, my friend said that John Mayer runs the Klon into the Tube Screamer. Let me let me go buy a Klon and yeah. a Tube Screamer. Let me experiment with which way goes which. Oh, I heard that you need gold plated patch cables to make the tone even crisper. Let me go get gold plated patch <laughs> yes, cables. That's right. And so now it's like the Axe FX for me is apart from when I'm practicing when when I use the most basic stuff. It's just an amazing toy that stops me from spending money on amps and pedals because it's all there. In fact, for those who don't have Axe FX yet, it's all there. Yeah. They act they update this thing so much that I I I never update it when update comes because it's like every 2 weeks there's an update with new pedals and new algorithms and new reverbs and it's like I haven't even gone through all of the it's stuff crazy. that it's that it came with, you know? And every time a new update comes, it's like you're getting yeah, a new a new batch of toys to play with one day. Yeah, and and I think, especially coming from my more traditional world that I've been a part of a lot longer than than digital, um, I'm much the same. If I can put together one preset, and I like to think of my presets as individual rigs. Like if I was going to go out and play this gig, what is the amp that I would bring? What levels of drive and dirt do I need? Um, and what other effects do I need? Reverb delay, something. I usually like to have maybe something swirly, whether it's uh, usually phaser for me. I'm, I'm a little bit more of a fan of phase or vibe. Um, but maybe the thing that I need is like a flanger or a chorus or um, maybe some pitch type of effects or something. But I try to organize my patches as individual rigs. So that way when I'm out playing... It's not as crazy as going from one preset to the next with like, okay, well, now I've got like this Fender tone and then this Vox tone, but now I've got like this super heavy uh, Mesa Boogie tone that is um, split super wide and I've got pitch effects and I'm going, clearly going into something that's very different. Um, 
I can do I do a little bit of that with prophecy because my main um, lead tone is a Mesa Boogie Mark IV uh, with some pitch effects and everything. But then my clean tone, I only have like three tones. My clean tone is a um, Fender Twin, and then I have um, a uh, a Vox uh, AC. It's actually the Morgan AC20 uh, for some bluesy edge of breakup type stuff. Um, but that still is when you consider what you could do in the Axe FX3, um, two amp blocks, eight different amplifiers switching and, and doing all the things and then, you know, stereoizing this, that, and the other thing. It's still pretty pared down, but it's not something that like, you know, Eric Johnson is a great example of this because he's been using basically the same rig ever since, you know, the late eighties, early nineties. Um, he's got his twin reverbs for his clean, He's got like a 50 watt Marshall for his rhythm tone that he puts either a tube screamer or a fuzz face in for that sort of thing. And then he's got his um, 100, 100 watt Marshall um, for his lead tone, his, his 100 watt Marshall plexis for his lead uh, with the um, BK Butler tube driver uh, and his tape delay and all that stuff. So that's like a three separate amplifier. He's running six of them because everything is basically in stereo. Um but that's still something that it's even though that's an insane analog rig, you can make something that's even more insane at the expense of um, authenticity in the Axe effect. So I still try to have this idea of authenticity with the rigs that I'm building where I have these smooth transitions from tone to tone, like using an expression pedal, I think is great for the drive tone because you can just dial in exactly how much you need before you go, you know, full blitz or whatever. Um, I think that's something that is tempting in the digital modelers of just going to the nth degree on whatever tone, but I think it is at the expense of authenticity. I still want to sound like I'm playing as much of an analog rig as I am, even though I'm utilizing and exploiting the conveniences of digital. Absolutely. Something else you said before, and it kind of has to do with how much you need versus how much would be, uh, how much would make life easier. It's something that I'm really passionate about because, you know, right now I'm going through this phase where I'm not playing gigs. I'm not playing with anybody else. I just want to focus on building up my own chops, the YouTube stuff, all of that or whatever. And so since I'm not gigging mm -hmm, yeah. at all, I don't, I have the Axe FX 3. It just sits there. But if I were going to start gigging, I could bring my Axe FX3 and get on the train, but I would probably just purchase an FX3 or FX9, whatever, not because I can't bring the Axe FX, but just because it's easier to have this always set up so I can work here when I want, and the Axe FX3 always, mm -hmm. always in my bag so that I can pick it up and leave when I need to leave and I don't have to worry about different things. And I think that's super important when we're thinking about, well, you know, musicians... Like you mentioned earlier, the idea of being a professional musician in the 20th century, 21st century, it's a thing of wearing many hats and having a lot of different things you have to worry about, you know, schedules with students, contracts, taxes, schedules with promoter. It's just so many little tiny things that if you start organizing your life, you can easily get lost in just trying to figure out your schedule before you even get to playing anything whatsoever. And so whenever there's a Absolutely. way, whenever there's a way that we can just streamline the process of getting to a gig or getting to recording something for our own music or getting to recording a video, the more things that we can leave set up that are just ready to go, the better it is. At least that, that's what I found for anyone who's doing this professionally, be it a YouTube rig, a live rig, if you can leave it set up at all times you are more likely to have more time to actually do it. So I totally understand the desire to have one mixer at home that doesn't move. Identical or very yes. similar mixer that's on the rack, that's just ready to go on the van when I need to go on the gig. It makes, it makes perfect sense to me. Real quick, I, I want to ask you about the bridge thing. So are you thinking of going full PRS with a Floyd Rose or are you thinking about just getting another Floyd, another PRS that has a traditional bridge? No, I would I would just go with the traditional bridge. I'm not a I'm not a dive bomber. Um and 
I would much rather have the the more simple setup of just a traditional uh, trem bridge rather than the lockers with a Floyd Rose and all that stuff. I've worked on a couple of Floyd Rose uh, guitars, just you know, students or people coming into music stores or or wanting a little bit of a basic setup. And I'm not great at um, adjusting a Floyd Rose. Maybe at some point it would be something that I would toy around with. Um, but my, the, the trim on my DGT is, is plenty, plenty good for what I am typically using it for my fear. And maybe, maybe I'm uh, a little bit prejudiced on this just because of how much I've seen in lessons, but you know, kid gets a new guitar for Christmas or birthday or something, and it's got a Floyd Rose and they come to lessons and now it's out of tune and they can't tune it into tune with the fine tuners. And now I'm hunting around for an Allen key. And now we have loosened it up, but now I've tuned it up, but now the bridge is off access. So now I've got to adjust the claws in the back. And everything just kind of is exacerbated. Now, um, obviously, if, if I got something, I'd have it set up or I'd set it up myself where it's, you know, kind of more set and forget. Um, but even so, like if I were to break a string on a gig, happens pretty rarely. Um, but if I were to break a string on a gig and I'm using a Floyd Rose and that thing's locked on the nut here and then it breaks and the, the tension is greater on the bridge and the bridge, you know, does its thing, you know, I would just rather go <laughs> so, more simple. I really, I'm really curious about the Strandberg ones because of the construction of Strandberg. And maybe you can answer this cause you have a, you have a fusion. Um, you know, you have the locker down here which makes sense. I mean, you need this anyway on on a stop on a stop uh, uh, tailpiece. Um, but then all of the other mechanisms for the trem stuff, tuning included, is all right here. So that makes it in my brain that would make it a lot simpler when it's still basically the same. Thread the string in through here. There's no lock. You just put it in, and then you lock it up here just as you would. A typical Strandberg. Um, what is, what is your experience with the uh, the Strandberg um, uh, uh, tremolo system? The tremolo system is definitely very very good. It's very reliable. You can dive bomb if you wanted to, and it would stay in tune. At least for me, it's staying in tune amazingly well. That being said, mm -hmm. if I was if I was going to perform live i really just like having a simple two-point trim with regular tuners and a headstock and that's just because i mean again when I, I've, I've played this strandberg now for close to 100 hours i've literally tuned it hmm. the first time i put the new strings on and then when i changed strings a couple weeks ago i tuned it again and i used the trim every single day while i'm playing and i've tuned it twice so nice. it stays in tune and, oh, and I've taken it outside, got on the train, got to the hotel, took it out, still in tune, got back home, the whole thing. So the tuning stability, as you already know, is phenomenal, even when using the trim. But it's just, if I'm, if I'm going to tune, if I do need to tune the guitar, I can't tune faster than if I could just reach the headstock and quickly tune. And something about that right. fear of needing to tune the guitar fast. And, you know, you're on stage, everything gets amplified, you know, the, there's less time and there's more to do. I would be nervous from a, a logical standpoint of, of just wanting to be able to do it as fast as possible. So I would probably go with a two point trim. I know PRS doesn't make any, mm, do, I don't know if they make any two-point trims that are not Floyd Roses on their core models. They're all models. six now, yeah. Yeah, they don't have any on their core models. But, you know, six-point trim, two-point trim, they're essentially the same thing if you know how to use them, you know, effectively. And, uh, yeah, I, I like having right. tuners. It's just, it's just faster. It's a little bit easier. And playing live like you do, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's scary. Yeah, and and there is that that fear of especially especially from playing so much live. I love a stop tailpiece just because it's so much simpler. Um, it's so much more stable. 
Um, the whole reason I got this one first with the stop is because I knew that it's just it's just going to hold up. Uh, I got this guitar f- really for a cruise ship gig that I did um, back in, uh, it was like April and May of last year. It was really kind of a, a short uh, stint, three weeks. Um, but yeah, like I've taken this on a boat that's been in the middle of a salty ocean, um, you know, coming from a, a relatively... Um, drier St. Louis sort of climate, uh, just getting out of winter and then getting this delivered, it held up phenomenally. I didn't need to, um, adjust the neck at all. Uh, I did a little bit of a, um, setup just with the, the multi-tool, um, on the boat, just from like playing it for so long. I'm like, well, this feels a little bit too low for me. Let me raise this stuff up. Um, it, it's just, if, if I could play just one guitar at, any gig, it would be a stop tailpiece just because of the the ruggedness of it. However, there's those moments where you know that you know, um, like one of the uh, one of the songs that I'm doing in this new production. This new production um, that's the same producer as the Prophecy Show. Uh, him and I have been working on it for um, several years now, but COVID got delayed and in, in everything. It's called Million Dollar Time Machine. And we are um, basically building our stage set as this giant time machine, 11 foot tall time machine that we bring out um, a bunch of different tribute acts. So uh, our tagline is 24 of the greatest musicians ever that come out of this time machine. And we're doing just a very wide breadth of music. Um, One of them is um, uh, Bon Jovi. We're doing You Give Love a Bad Name. And some of the stuff that Richie Sambora plays, he's definitely on the bar a little bit more and I want to be as particular and and as accurate as I can so that it feels as real as it possibly can be. And when you don't have that ability just to drop that tuning just a couple times, it's like, man, I know I'm only using this like 10% of the time, but I miss having the access to use it 10% of the time. So I'm, I'm kind of constantly at a little bit of a, um, a little bit of an argument with myself where I love stop tailpieces. This would be, if I had a signature guitar, it would be a stop tailpiece. But that being said, there is this extra little sauce of, you know, the DGT with a little bit of trim on a nice chord, uh, chord shape. That's really what David Grissom uses the trim for. It's not meant to be, um, you know, slamming down like a Floyd Rose, but then getting to the next level of being super accurate on some of these tunes that I want to be super accurate on, I need a trim. <laughs> yeah. And of course we could say, oh, just get a whammy pedal, but come on. It's not the same thing. Got You got to do it the not analog the way yeah. with the right hand, right? With the screw in, you, ju- you just got to do it. It's, it's, it's a thing. It's a guitar thing. Yeah. And, and it makes, it, it makes a difference, um, audience wise too, right? So, you know, if, if you're watching the guitar player and if you're, you know, even a hobbyist or just, you know, someone that's just into guitar and you know what the whammy bar does and you see someone not use it, but you hear it, you're going to question, is he actually playing the thing up there or is this, is this tracks or is it something else going on? You know, authenticity is, I think, especially in today's market where so much can be digital. And I think, um, I think, especially being mostly a live player. Um, I like doing studio stuff. I've done studio stuff before, but I'm really kind of at my heart. I like being a live player. Um, So much of the studio world is now getting into the live world where you question whether or not are these people actually playing. Um, I think the Macy's Day Parade is is a really good example because all that stuff, most of that stuff I think is tracked. Um, Just one, there's no way you can get that clean of audio um, from a parade with all of these, you know, you would need like, (laughs) you would need like a thousand channel mixer for all of this stuff. Um, rather than just a couple of channels for tracks and stuff. And it's cold. Singers aren't going to sound as great as they would on the, um, on the recording. So a lot of it is tracked, um, for utility mostly, but so much of it can, can filter over into a live performance we're starting to sort of miss just the authenticity and the honesty and the risk of a live performance. You know, seeing something that's played perfectly with tracks is cool because you feel like you're getting, you know, the studio uh, polish on it. But seeing a guitar player live rip into a solo that's 
derivative of what's on the recording is an element of risk and anticipation. Like, what is he going to play next? What's going to happen? How long is this going to go? I don't know. And I think that's one of the things that makes John Mayer so great is a lot of his stuff that he does live is different, sometimes slightly different, sometimes very different to the studio recording. And, um, you know, I guess back to my original point of the uh, uh, tremolo and all this stuff, I want to be as honest of a guitar player as I can when I'm on stage. Will you go and try to SE, or are you just immediately going to full snobbery to the core model? You know, uh, the the SE DGT looks, I mean, it, I, I've seen a lot of videos on it, and it looks like it's an incredible guitar for that price. So I absolutely would. It's something that I do have my um, my eye set on. The The issue that I have is I'm also getting the itch for position two and four. <laughs> I, I love like a two humbucker setup. Um, and the Strandberg does the whole position two thing really well. I like, you know, so um, if I go back... If I go back, there's a uh, bridge humbucker and there's so much position two in that, even just out of the, out of the twin humbuckers. Um, so I like that. But that being said, again, it's this 10% that might be really, really, really particular. Um, I, I kind of want a hum single hum PRS. They don't have that in the SE or the S2. Um, so it's like, man, am I, am I going to maybe sell some stuff or just, you know, uh, buck up and spend like a ton of money because I want like a special semi hollow or the modern Eagle five that just hit the core line, which I think just sounds incredible. Um, and you get so many different tonal options out of it. Um, the new studio, the PRS studio, um, that's kind of their take of hum single single. Um, all these things are like giving me, you know, that big itch for, um, of course, it has the trim, which is, you know, another 10%. Uh, and um, and then, you know, the three pickup, the hum single single. I used to have a Strat, uh, and I sold my Strat to get my DGT. Um, and I, I that's definitely a smarter move because I was just um, – I don't think I'm really a Strat guy. Um, but now that I don't have one – now I'm missing position two and four. I don't, it's it's kind of this crazy this crazy thing. Um, after I started playing a telly, I realized that I'm playing a telly. I'm playing my Mexican telly more than I'm playing my. Um... Oh yeah, there we go. I'm always um, an HSA oh, guy. No, that's, that's your Parker. Yeah, but always HSA for me. Always. If it's not HSA, yes. I just can't. I can't do it because, like you, I need two and four for when I want to be funky. And I need the humbuckers for one. I need to humbucker because I'm a guitarist. Yeah, and I'm getting so much of that itch of uh, hum single hum. Um, the new Charvel uh, Guthrie Govan model. Um, his, I think his signature, the import line, is also also looks like it would be a great guitar, 24 fret. I think Lumen Lay on that as well. I really like the Lumen Lays um, for a dark stage with the Strandberg. Um, that would be definitely a, a pretty big derivation for me. I played the uh, the full expensive one. I didn't own it, but I played it for about 20 minutes at a, at a uh, Sam Ash. And I had yeah. to fight with all of my might not to pull out a credit card and just say, fuck it, give me the guitar. It's it's <laughs> so good. Yeah. It's so good and so comfortable and it sounds so good. And the neck is... Oof, that, that's, that's, a, that's a guitar. I haven't tried the cheaper model yet, but... I can say the the full fledged, you know, however three, four, five, I forget how many thousands of dollars it is. It's a damn, damn good yeah, guitar. Yeah, I think it's like thirty six or something. Yeah, it's 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 a great guitar. I like the one that is just the all one color. I think the burst looks ugly. That's just me. But the one that's just yeah. that all one roasted looking color looks amazing and it, it sounds and plays amazing, just phenomenal. Yeah, and well, and anything that Guthrie would, you know, put his name on would certainly be um, incredible. I've seen some earlier footage of him doing stuff with Lick Library uh, where he's playing a McCarty, a PRS McCarty model. Uh, and then, of course, he had the signature Sirs for a while, and now he's moved over to Charvel. And um, Guthrie is just such an anomaly. I love him. I love his approach. Um 
I listen to his music, you know, pretty often. Um, Aristocrats is a great album. Um, I think maybe they just came out with their second album. I don't think I've checked it out yet, or he's about to release their second album. I need to, and if so, I need to check it out. Um, and of course, Erotic Cakes, which is just, you know, like a masterclass in modern guitar playing across a bunch of different styles. But his approach is so grounded in music, even though he's just an incredible technician. His approach to music is just, uh, it's a lot like what we're saying, but then, you know, again, kind of to the nth degree, because it's Guthrie Govan. Um, But he he approaches everything from such a musical foundation that is really inspiring to a lot of players, Um, especially shredders, because he's not really like, I guess, um, a traditional shredder, even though he can just, shred with the best of them absolutely and better than the best of them um you know if he's really wound up um but he's such a musician at his core it's great to see that and it's great to learn from him. it's great to watch all of his instructionals Guthrie Govan he's one of a oh, handful of guitarists so like when I think about guitarists sometimes I just think about like what their attributes are it's like oh Steve uh Joe Satriani he's the bluesy legato player uh steve Vai is the legato classical influenced player i just that's how i categorize people in my head mm-hmm. a few guitarists guthrie govin is one tommy emmanuel is two there's some others of course oh, yeah i can't tell you that they're just they're just guitarists what, what type of music do they play good you know they can all stick and shred they can do fingers it's just you know to have that much talent and to have it always readily available, it's something that I can't really fathom, to be honest. Because he can be playing a, a, a rock gig, and then you say something, and he's like, oh yeah, we can play a jazz look like this. Or, oh, we can do pirate stuff like this. It's like, how is that all just there waiting for you to use all the time? Tommy Emanuel's the same way. Of course, everyone knows him for his finger style playing, but if you give him an electric guitar, he is mm. shockingly... I, I know you know this, but... He rips? He's shockingly good as an electric guitar player. And you would think to yourself, like, I, I can't fathom how you can get that good at finger style playing and also be that good at the electric with a pick shredding all of that stuff and playing through changes. I just can't. It's too much talent for me. Yeah. And I think those guys for sure are just at the at the top of the rung for everyone um, yeah, it, it, especially Tommy Manuel. If you can have a guy that's playing really sensitive, really um, beautiful finger style arrangements, and then like get up and shred with Satriani uh, at like a G three or something, it's like that guy's just on a completely another level. Um, in in Guthrie is is the same way where he's just on a completely another another level where so much of he talks about this as well in some of his instructionals where, you know, music is a language. Uh, we've talked about that. Um, but music is like Guthrie's primary language. Like English for him has got to be secondary because he's just he's just so connected musically. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Well, it's it's been a while. We've been talking a while. We definitely have to connect again because I see that we have a lot more gear stuff to talk about. We barely scratched the surface on HSA. We didn't talk about sure at all. We didn't talk about anything extensive. So hopefully we'll chat again. Uh, But it's been, it's been great meeting you. Um, For those who don't know, I met Matthew just now, essentially. We had a few emails, but this, uh, he's exactly how I'd expect him to be. Knowing that he likes Stramberg, PRS, dumb picks, and Axe FX's after having analog gear. Only, only someone with that type of background could this, could be this enjoyable to talk to. So I've enjoyed talking to you today. Hopefully we talk again soon. Yeah, I've enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much for having me on. And just one more time. So your YouTube channel is, of course, just Matthew Dale, D-A-L-E. Matthew spelled like everyone else spells Matthew. And Uh, Actually, one T. One T and Matthew. Oh. Okay, so Matthew with one T, Dale, D-A-L-E. Also your website where your courses Mm -hmm. are. Yep, that's MatthewDale.com, again, with one T, so all kind of the same stuff, M-A-T-H-E-W-D-A-L-E dot C-O-M. And you'll have your tour updates, that that latest production, that's planned for the spring, you said? 
Uh, yes. Yeah, so Million Dollar Time Machine is planned. We're going to be, our first gig is in Marion, Illinois on March 10th. And then, yeah, I'll put up um, my updates there. And then I'm going to be doing a kind of a prophecy recap on my YouTube channel um, so people can kind of see what's going on behind the scenes uh, with that. Um, and if you do want to learn more about those productions, you can go to Million Dollar Ticks, M I L L I O N D O L L A R T I X dot com or the prophecy show dot com. You can kind of get a little bit of a taste of what uh, what we're doing there. Um, that's definitely kind of my big uh, tour stuff that I'm doing right now, in addition to some of the local stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, go ahead and I'll uh, mention to your listeners, you know, go ahead and check out Theory Logic if you do want to. Uh, dive in a little bit deeper to the music theory conversation, especially on a fundamental level. Um, and yeah, Andre, thank you so much again for having me on and, and having a really enjoyable conversation. I don't think we've really, uh, it, I know it's been a little bit, uh, a little long, but I have felt like we just sat down and started talking 15 minutes ago.